Hi everyone, we're talking about cluster headaches in this lesson. So we're going to talk about what they are, what causes them, and some of the risk factors for getting them. We're also going to talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So cluster headaches are also known as histamine headaches, and you'll see why that is later on in this lesson. A cluster headache is a primary neurovascular headache disorder involving groups or clusters of headache episodes over a period of time. We're going to get into more specific detail as to these groups or clusters of headache episodes later on in this lesson. Compared to other types of headache disorders, cluster headaches are more rare. They affect less than 1% of the general population. And the mean age of onset for getting cluster headaches is between the ages of 20 to 40. Now let's talk about risk factors for getting cluster headaches. One of them is going to be a family history. If you have a parent or sibling who has cluster headaches, you're more likely to have it yourself. Although it's not going to account for many cases of cluster headaches, it's only going to account for 5% or less of cases. So family history doesn't contribute too much to getting a cluster headache, but it is a potential risk factor. For males outnumber females 3 to 1. Age is also going to be an important risk factor. So we talked about the ages where patients are more likely to have an onset of cluster headache, but it's more likely to occur after the age of 30 as opposed to a younger patient. Another associated factor for getting cluster headaches is alcohol consumption. So if a patient drinks alcohol, they're more likely to have cluster headaches. Smoking or tobacco use is also another risk factor. Having allergies is also another associated factor with regards to having cluster headaches as well. So if you have cluster headaches, you're more likely to have allergies and more specifically seasonal allergies. And previous head injury or trauma is also another potential risk factor. As we will see, some of these risk factors are more associations and they may actually be triggers. And we'll talk about those triggers in the next upcoming slides. Before we get into the signs and symptoms, let's briefly talk about some of the pathophysiology behind cluster headaches, or where do cluster headaches originate? So it's important to make note of the fact that the pathophysiology behind cluster headaches is not completely understood. But cluster headaches appear to occur in a pattern, and they're more likely to occur at particular times of day, suggesting that there is a potential role of the biological clock within the hypothalamus. So each person has their own biological clock, and this biological clock is located in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is this area of the brain here above the pituitary gland, and next to or below the thalamus, and a more close-up view of the hypothalamus shows that it is comprised of many different nuclei and the nucleus that may be involved is the suprachiasmatic nucleus or portions of the suprachiasmatic nucleus which would be where the biological clock or where your circadian rhythm would be generated and there has also been some finding that the potential origination of some of the issues from cluster headaches may occur in the posterior hypothalamic gray matter and then there has been some finding that the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve are also complicit in the pathophysiology in this condition as well. So there may be some alterations in trigeminal facial neuronal circuitry. So we won't get into any more detail there, but because of these particular pathophysiological mechanisms, we can see periodicity with the attacks or the episodes of headache. And facial nerve and trigeminal nerve involvement are going to lead to particular signs and symptoms, which we will talk about in the next upcoming slides. Let's talk about the clinical features of cluster headaches. So because it is a cluster headache, the headaches occur in groups or clusters. So over time, over the patient's lifetime, they're going to have clusters or groups of these headache attacks or headache episodes. And there will be periods in between each group or cluster. So a cluster will occur over a particular period of time, and we'll talk about that in more detail here in a moment. And then there will be a period of remission where there will be no signs or symptoms of a cluster headache. And then this will continue. The patient will have another group or cluster of headaches, and then there will be another period of remission and so on. So interestingly, these episodes or attacks will often occur most commonly during sleep or early morning hours. Some patients will have them late evening, but they do seem to occur during these periods of time. That's why we talked about a potential role of the biological clock of the hypothalamus being involved. Now when patients have clusters of headaches, they can be anywhere from one every other day to 
eight times per day. That's going to be the more average or more common frequency of these attacks. And the onset of the headaches is going to often be sudden onset. There's going to be a sudden onset that often peaks within 10 to 15 minutes. And then the duration of the headache is going to last anywhere from 15 to 180 minutes or three hours. Episodes can then occur over the course of several weeks. So these are going to be some of the timing with regards to these cluster of headache attacks. But there are going to be more specific clinical findings that are characteristic of cluster headaches that will make them more knowable to a patient and to a clinician. And some of these include the following. So in this diagram here, we can see some of them, and we'll get into some of those here in a moment. The location of these cluster headaches is going to be most often unilateral. So it's going to occur on one side of the head. It is oftentimes going to be located in and around the eye. It's going to occur either retroorbital or around the eye, so it can feel like it's behind the eye or in the eye itself. It can be in the temporal area, so it can be in the forehead. It can occur on the cheek or in the jaw as well. And again, it's all going to occur on one side of the head. These attacks or these headaches are going to be very severe. So it's going to be severe or very severe. And because we mentioned that it occurs oftentimes in sleep in many patients, it will often awaken the patient from sleep, that severity of pain. And the quality of the pain or quality of the sensation that the patient is feeling is going to be a constant ache or stabbing pain. And in some patients, they may describe feeling like the eye is being pushed out. So these are all going to be very characteristic findings with a cluster headache. And then even more specific findings in cluster headaches are going to be the following. A red watery eye. We mentioned that the eye is often very involved in cluster headaches. So red watery eye can mean tearing so that patient can have tearing of the eye. This is due to facial nerve involvement. There can be eyelid edema and there can be conjunctival injection. So you can see here the conjunctiva are affected. And again, this is going to be unilateral or one-sided. Patient can also experience runny nose or rhinorrhea on the affected side. This may be due to the trigeminal nerve involvement. And then along with this runny nose, there can be nasal congestion. Patients may also experience forehead or facial sweating. So forehead or facial sweating on the affected side can occur. Ptosis, which is a drooping eyelid, may also occur. And meiosis, which is a constricted pupil, may also be something that may occur in a patient with cluster headaches. So these are all going to be more specific findings in cluster headaches. And there are particular triggers for these attacks or these episodes of headache. Some of them, again, include alcohol and tobacco use. We talked about some of those before as potential associated risk factors for having cluster headaches. But some other triggers include hot weather, light exposure, stress, histamine or excessive histamine release, which can occur from seasonal allergies. This is why cluster headaches can be called histamine headaches. Nitroglycerin use can also exacerbate or trigger cluster headaches. Exercise and strong sense can also be triggers as well. And then cluster headaches can be grouped into the following types. One known as episodic cluster headaches and the other known as chronic cluster headaches. So a patient has episodic cluster headaches when they have at least two clusters that lasts for seven days to one year with a symptom-free period lasting at least three months. And this is going to be the more common type affecting 80% of patients. Now there are a subset of these patients that can transition into a chronic cluster headache type. And this is where the clusters of headache last for at least one year without remission, or the remission occurs for less than three months. So this is the other type of cluster headache. Now let's talk about how clinicians diagnose cluster headaches. It is often going to be a clinical diagnosis. So doing a history, performing a physical examination, getting that particular pattern of cluster headache attacks, and then also seeing those particular signs and symptoms that we talked about here before. So that's going to be important with regards to making the diagnosis and then utilizing the International Headache Society or IHS criteria for a cluster headache with both of these required to make the diagnosis. So one is that episodes or attacks of unilateral pain. So it's one-sided pain, oftentimes affecting in and around the eye or in the temporal area that occur for 15 to 180 minutes, as mentioned before, 15 minutes to three hours that occurs at least every other day, so alternating, or up to eight times per day. 
in these episodes or attacks occur with at least one associated sign or symptom, such as rhinorrhea or that runny nose, lacrimation or that tearing that we talked about before, or others. So those list of signs and symptoms we talked before in the last couple slides are going to be important when making the diagnosis as well. And that these signs and symptoms occur on the ipsilateral side, ipsilateral meaning on the same side as the headache or the pain. Imaging may be utilized in some cases, but imaging is going to be used in cases where a clinician wants to exclude other possible causes of the headache or other associated clinical findings. Once a clinician has made the diagnosis, how do they treat cluster headaches? So before we talk about treatment, it's important to note that spontaneous remission of cluster headaches occurs in roughly 12% of patients. So with out treatment, 12% can have a spontaneous remission. But it's also important to identify and avoid the triggers we talked about before, including alcohol consumption and tobacco use. There are particular categories of treatments for cluster headache. One of them is going to be what is called abortive treatment. So when a patient has the headache, these treatments are going to help abort the headache itself. So it's going to help stop the headache. One of them is going to be oxygen. So utilizing oxygen is actually one treatment for cluster headache. And the treatment is 100% O2 for 15 minutes. This helps resolve the headache in many cases. And this is an important testing point when learning about cluster headaches. A group of medications known as triptans, which are also used for migraine headaches, can be used in cluster headaches as well. And one of them is sumatriptan. And then NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Advil can be used for pain relief in some cases. And for prophylaxis, meaning that these are treatments to help reduce the onset of cluster headaches in the future. Some of them include the following. Calcium channel blockers like verapamil. Mood stabilizers have also been used in some cases, and one of them is lithium. Galcanezumab, methasergide, and prednisolone. So these are also some potential treatments as well. If you want to learn more about headache disorders and other neurological conditions, please check out my neurology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.